let's all clap for Scott Clark. <laughs> Scott, um, I've known him for, gosh, almost since the beginning, pretty much, yeah, at least nine years. And, um, you know, he's been tuning these things. Actually, I think you got your start largely tuning Megasquirt stuff, uh, starting in the kit days. That is correct. I started off uh, much like Jordan did. Where, there he is, sitting yep, right over yep. there, uh, with turbocharged Ford probes. A buddy of mine came to me because I, I had a little bit of talent with a soldering iron and uh, asked me if I would assemble this kit for him because AEM and, and Fast and the other guys did not make a system to do the V6s, the turbocharged probes. And, that, you know, it had instructions and I, it looked like painting by numbers, so I... Uh, had at it, and then like the first guys they ended up getting help from were you and that that Ryan guy, yeah. And I don't know if he's still around or what is he? Cool. Of course. Well, that's of interesting. Course. You describe it as uh, painting by numbers because that's how I describe it to a lot of people when they're looking at the kit stuff. It's like you know, there's they're, maybe they've never soldered something together before in their lives and they're scared to death of it. And I said, really, if you can follow some basic instructions, it's basically paint by numbers to put a, a kit together. Just put this part where it says that part goes. And sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, but since then, you know, Scott and I first met, I think, on the Bonneville Salt Flats, in person anyways, we had talked several times, right. uh, tuning in Gary Hart's car back uh, eight, nine years ago. Oh, five and six Oh, five era. and six, yeah. 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 Um, and then Gary got his first record in 08 and bumped it in 12? No, that's when he blew up and quit, I think. Yeah, 10 anyway. or 11, something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like but. that. But, uh, and then since then, we've uh, worked together a number of times on a number of cars out there. And uh, he usually makes sure, it's, makes sure it's almost perfect when it gets there. And then we just goof off and act like we're doing something once it's there and, and the car goes fast. So, and since then, he's been involved in a ton of other stuff over the years, drag racing and uh, et cetera. I don't think I've ever seen him drive a race car. So we've got to fix that at some point. Um, I've never seen him work on a diesel either for a guy called Diesel Geek. But, um, but he's, he's tuned some Long fast story. cars. <laughs> he's tuned some fast cars. So that said, Scott, have at it. All right. So uh, again, my name's Scott Clark. Um, I guess uh, my title this last three years, I would be an independent calibration engineer or tuner is the, the term we use in the aftermarket. But uh, if you're tuning stationary generators and, and engines in cornfields, like I spend some of my time doing, uh, it's calibration engineer. Not a degreed engineer, not very much formal education, a little bit of manufacturer type training for different uh, ECUs that are out there, but, but, but pretty basic. I, I started off like most of you guys, um, just doing uh, simple Megasquirt projects, uh, had tasks that I needed to solve, had an engine that we needed to run, and I was a little bit of a gearhead, and more technical as, as you guys are compared to most of your friends. Uh, so like you, I inherited the job of uh, making these engines run. Um, and over the years, uh, I found myself being asked more and more to work on more advanced projects. Um, nothing that I would call, I would say what I work on is more top level of the grassroots or amateur motorsports. I mean, there are guys sitting in the crowd back here that have worked at professional motorsports levels that will probably be snoozing 20 minutes from now, but uh, that's okay. I've, I was asked to explain uh, the approach I take um, for the successful projects that I'm, that I'm working on and, uh, and kind of walk you through it. It's going to be decidedly less technical than you might expect, especially, especially after uh, Bruce and Phil and these guys, but um, we're going to allot lots of time for Q&A to go over details, so hopefully I get you guys woke up. Um, and I apologize up front for my lack of Bruce-like charisma. I don't drink coffee, <laughs> but I think I need to start. So, okay, anyway, um, I specialize in custom engine management. Um, I don't do OEM retuning, so I try to avoid like the HP tuners and EFI Live, uh, uh, <coughs> Dynojet Power Commander, things like that. I try to stick with standalone ECUs. I started off with Megasquirt, but, but um, at last check, it's actually closer to 40 systems that I've, that I've worked on, but uh, I would say there's 20 of them that I'm very comfortable with, things like AEM, Haltech, um, you know, the, the majors that are out there, Electromotive, Motec, um, and obviously Megasquirt 3 is one of my favorites, if not my favorite overall. Um, okay, next slide. Let me catch up with you here. So, um, if there's one thing I've observed in uh, successful racing projects, guys that are going out to Bonneville or the Ohio Mile or to Drag Week, um, the, you know, the bigger grassroots type events and the guys that are setting records, there's, uh, re regardless of the type of cars that they're racing out there, there are some real, you know, common themes or, or things that you see after 10 years of looking at this stuff that, that what makes a guy successful or a group 
successful on a project. And I mean, I, I've broken it down to, to the three the three major things you have to have available um, for your project are time, talent, and resources. A uh, hundred dollars, sometimes more. Um, it, it, basically, I'm going to focus on the talent today because everybody knows that you you know you're going to have to spend money, and, and what you can do is proportional to what you can spend. But if you uh, if you maximize your talent and your own personal skills, you can get by doing a lot more with spending a lot less money, which has kind of been my specialty. So I'm just going to go through these first slides here pretty quick and not bore you guys. Most of you uh, know what we're talking about here, but but I, I would just say the. Uh, the, the only specialized tools that I use that the other average mechanics don't have is the uh, is my multimeter and my oscilloscope. Um, most of the time, I'm measuring continuity. Just a simple check: Hey, does this wire from the back of the car go to the front? Is it continuous? That's that's what where I'm breaking that thing out most of the time. Then there's uh, voltage, uh, resistance. If you're working on a crank trigger and you're you're changing a pull up pull up resistor or something like that, and uh, you know, so we'll do that. But uh, and then occasionally you can, uh, you know, have a, a multimeter that will do RPM, duty cycle, um, that kind of stuff. But uh, probably my favorite tool though is the oscilloscope. And I don't know, there's probably some in the building here or, or demonstration going on. But if anybody wants more detail on, on how to use an oscilloscope, um, basically it just displays voltage over time. And the, what I use that on is almost always uh, crank trigger and cam trigger signals. You know, you can see if there's uh, ignition noise getting in that signal. So a uh, good idea to have a, uh, a portable oscilloscope handy when you're doing this stuff. Next most important thing um, that I've noticed by watching these guys that are successful, uh, every project has, is broken down into major project roles, okay, every car. Um, the reason I have the picture of this 1940 Ford up there, that was built by uh, Andy Leach at a company called Cal Automotive Creations. Um, he is a former Troy Trepanier Rad Rides by Troy employee. This guy uh, it won the 2013 Riddler Award at the Detroit Autorama. That, that car, uh, the entire project was carefully budgeted. It was just under $2 million to build that car. That included all the, uh, there was a million dollars worth of CNC work on that. Um, if you turn it upside down, the chassis and the underpinnings of this thing are absolutely phenomenal. So if you want to, uh, if you want more details about it, ask me, but you can Google uh, checkered past 40 Ford and uh, get all kinds of pictures of the engineering detail that went into this. And I'm not, the reason I'm speaking about that is not, go ahead. Surely that runs a MoTeC, right? No, sir. Megascore 1, MS1 Extra. Interesting story behind that. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, yes, definitely. I, uh, I got asked because these guys bought a kit from... Who's the guy that sells the throttle bodies that go above BDA? Fran Olson sells these kits with injectors that point down into the top of a root style blower. And they couldn't fit a carburetor under the hood they wanted, so they bought this kit from Fran and then said, what, what the heck are we doing? Um, and they got my name. And they happened to live in my hometown, which was really cool. I didn't even know they were there. But uh, the reason I'm pointing out this $2 million car and why it's relevant to us is these guys were the most organized from a project management perspective that I had ever seen on any, any project. And I'm, I'm sure it parallels uh, pro-level motorsports. But they literally had one person doing nothing but running Microsoft Project the whole time for this build that was going on for about two years. Um, and, and they would sit there and say, OK, Scott, you and your buddy are going to have time at the front of the car to maybe test the ignition or do whatever you want, we'll give you 25 minutes. You know, they had it broken down into five minute increments and they said, after that, the paint guy needs to come around and, and wipe up and do some more polishing. So it, it, it was insanely organized and, and uh, interesting to see how these guys did. But if you think about it, when, when a guy comes up to you and says, I'm gonna spend $2 million and I want you to build me a car that's guaranteed to perform, which in this case, win the Riddler Award. Um, that's the kind of stuff these guys are doing to make sure they're successful. And the reason I think it relates to us is if you spend a little bit of time before you start getting your fingers dirty, lining out the project tasks and setting milestones and goals that you need to do. First, I want to get this engine running on fuel only. You know, Then maybe set, get, get that accomplished. And then the next weekend, I want to get this thing running on my ignition as well, which is the next big challenge. So if you break your project down into tasks like that, that's what these guys do. And that's how they meet their dates and their deadlines. So if you know you've got a race in three months, well, 
take that time, divide it up, and, and start applying your milestones across that time spread. That's how these guys are, are doing really well. So I've, I've tried to adopt that as, as much as I possibly could. Um, other project roles on here. Obviously, there's the electronics and tuning guy that I always seem, and I, I see in this crew over here. Jordan is the uh, obviously the the guy who's handling that for the for this group over here, and that obviously very successful car. That thing flies. That car is awesome. We'll talk about that later. But uh, you know, I, he, they've obviously broken up the roles the same way. They've got a guy that's responsible to make sure that my ignition's working right, that my crank and cam signals are working right. You know, that I don't have ignition break up at wide open throttle. And if you heard that thing whamming into the rev limiter about a half hour ago, you know that that thing is running really clean and they've done a really good job. What rev limiter? What rev limiter? I hope that was a rev limiter. <laughs> I hope that was not valve springs. All right. Um, the next thing is uh, they'll break it up into a chassis guy. You know, um, the, the Bonneville car that we work on, Lee Cecilio, I'm going to show you a video here in a minute, um, that has a dedicated chassis guy. The guy fabricated and built the whole thing, and he understands more about suspension and angles on the car and how to make the thing hook up in, in low traction situations by changing the four link settings and, and stuff that's, that's way over my head. He's a specialist in that, and, and, and that's na his name is Ryan Fain. He actually did some... Uh, did some chassis work on Jerry's land speed car back there. Yeah, it goes straight. He re really knows what he's doing. Well, that guy will tell you he doesn't care anything about the engine. He says, I look at that little silver thing that's going round and round and round. Everything behind that is his responsibility. Everything in front of that is my responsibility, me and the guy who built the engine, So, uh, which I do not do. I'm strictly an electronics guy as well. Um, so then we've got the uh, the driver. Obviously, a car needs a driver. Um, I see that over here in this group. Driver just walked off. But uh, yeah, um, when we it, I've worked on some Engine Masters Challenge projects where you get to eliminate the uh, driver and the chassis from the equation, and that helps a lot because drivers sometimes are a pain in the butt. <laughs> So the next thing uh, that I think is really important when you're working on your, uh, your race projects, and whether it's a, a, an autocross thing or a, a land speed or drag racing or, or whatever you're doing, um, as much testing time as you can allot in your project is absolutely essential. Like most of these projects, before I even put something on the engine, I spend time on my bench with a, a gym stim. You guys know what a gym stim is? Everybody in here a, a simulator? Definitely, definitely want to have one of those and, and play with, uh, you know, whichever mega squirt you're running um, on a stimulator because you can, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it basically lets you run the engine or run the ECU as if it were running a real engine. And, it, and it's uh, well, less than $100, I think. Aren't those things still? Well, they're very cool tool to have. I actually use my gym stim to run other ECUs um, before I'm setting up the car. So I'll use it to uh, test nitrous outputs. You know, is a real popular thing to do. Actually, I'll flow a whole nitrous system on a bench with a stimulator running the engine um, to make sure that I've got the distribution right and see how many, you know, the, the whole pounds per hour. The nitrous guy wants to know how much it flows over time at given duty cycles. So definitely as much testing on the bench as you can do with the gym stim. And we can give all kinds of demonstrations, I think, here later. Um, obviously, the next thing once you get the engine running is dynamometer testing. Um, let me, I have some more detailed notes here. Hang on. Yeah, so things on the, uh, you know, the last few years I've, I've worked on higher end projects that have gotten me on the engine dynos, engine dynamometers, and I don't know how many people here, I know we all have seen or will see chassis dynamometer use, but uh, actually testing your program on an engine dyno, very helpful and handy stuff. Um, I, I think that the number one th the thing there is that the engine's much easier to work on. You can, if there's a leak, it's easy to wrench on, it's not in the car, you can get at it. Um, I, I've been doing this more and more with Engine Masters Challenge and with the guys at Blueprint Crate Engines that uh, I, they spend about half my time working for them. And uh, the benefits of an engine dyno are huge. There's an amazing number of things you can do there. You can do, uh, you know, a st steady state testing, super helpful. So you can just pick maybe four or six different areas in your load um, and RPM map and, and just sit there steady state. You know, you got a cooling system going, everything's fine. And you can just sit there and bump the timing up in tenth of a degree increments and watch that torque come up. And then as soon as the torque level's off, you know you found your roughly your mean best MBT. There's about eight different ways to quantify that acronym. Uh, uh, maximum brake torque, mean best timing, I've heard of a billion ways, but anyway, that, the things like that on the engine dyno really can help you kind of pre-map um, where the engine wants to be once it's in the car. Um, other things you can do, sweep tests. So you've probably seen lots of engine dyno videos on YouTube 
wide open throttle, pick an RPM rate, and it sweeps up to red line and, and measures the power as it goes. You can build and adjust your timing curve. And I have a video to show you of us doing that here in just a minute. Let me get through the rest of the boring parts. Um, one thing I'll bring up, I, I have my bullet there for limited testing. Sometimes you might find yourself in a situation, and, and I have, where uh, here just a couple weeks ago, actually, um, where someone says, we have an engine, we didn't have time to put it on the engine dyno. Okay, well, we'll put it on the chassis dyno. Well, parts were late, and we got to be at this event Monday. We didn't have time to put it on a, cha or a chassis dyno. So, uh, and this is the case. I uh, did a, uh, worked on a, I guess, a street legal uh, S10 pickup that we took on Hot Rod Magazine Drag Week event here a couple of weeks ago. And uh, coincidentally, it, it did not win its class in the event. And I blame that on lack of testing because we did not start the engine until maybe three hours before we had to load up and hit the road for the first track. So lots of, lots of lessons learned. We torched some spark plugs. We probably hurt the engine a little bit. But we did, although we did not win the event, we ended up uh, technically or unofficially the quickest street legal vehicle in the world. It ran a 6.14 quarter mile at 220 miles an hour. So, yeah, and he was... <laughs> <laughs> they weren't happy with our choice of ECU on that, but that's a long story. But uh, anyway, so the, the lesson, I actually used that guy as a bad example, uh, just poor planning, and we did not do a very good performance at the event. Other than running one quick ET, uh, we weren't consistent and reliable because we had no testing time. We actually ran it on gasoline for the street, for the highway crews. You have to drive 300 miles between tracks every day for five days, and then you have to race at the tracks. In race mode, we would run on M1 methanol. And uh, we literally did not run that engine on methanol until five minutes before we staged it the first time. And it just, we had five or six passes that were complete miserable fails on, you know, 20,000 people watching online on a live webcast. So that's why I wanted to bring up that example. You really want to plan ahead on this stuff if you can. Next slide. Um, okay. Do you want to, uh, yeah, so just first one, go ahead and play this real quick. This was the first Engine Masters Challenge engine I worked on. Did this for about three years with these guys. And uh, we, we did really well. We finished second place in 2012. And I just wanted to show you an example. This is the first time we put the uh, high resolution crank trigger. We put a 36 minus one uh, Ford wheel on here. And take a look at, the, uh, look at the ignition timing on this first. In a second it stabilizes and you can see what's going on. First thing you notice when you go with the high res trigger wheel is how crazy accurate the ignition timing is just looking at it with a timing light. And if you go through the trouble of setting a, an oscilloscope with a couple of channels to look at the crank trigger versus where the spark ends up, that is why, you know, in my opinion, you want to go with the high res trigger wheels. But here's a dyno pole. Notice the AFR as the two right columns go all over the place. For reference, that engine on, uh, it's naturally aspirated, 10 and a half to one compression that year, and it made 1.55 foot-pounds of torque per cubic inch, which is like holy grail territory for specific output. Uh, it was a 1956 cast block. We upset a whole lot of people there, and I think the guy that beat us that year is coming to the event. He'll be walking in here any minute. see the air fuels get weird side to side. Um, this is right before we decided to go uh, the next year we did individual O2s per cylinder and then that was when James wrote us or Ken or somebody wrote us code for individual closed loop corrections per cylinder. And this is 385 cubic inches I think in this trim. Last pull here. But this project is where I probably learned the most. Um, I was getting advice from guys like Wes Kaiser who were standing back there, who at the time was uh, with Roush Yates. And he couldn't tell me like directly how to do what I needed to do, but he could tell you, hey, uh, try this, you know, do, maybe just see what this does and see what happens. So um, some things we really learned on this engine were that the timing of the injector event, especially on crazy naturally aspirated engines with, with aggressive cam profiles, um, is, is really effective. Um, you, know, you might pick up one or two or three percent horsepower real easily just by playing with the phasing of the injection timing, which is lots of points for these guys. So go to the next link. 
This is the 2013 uh, 428 cubic inch Pontiac of uh, Mark Dahlquist entered this last year. And we did surprisingly well. We were one of the top finishing pushrod engines. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of how we stepped up our game in 2013. You'll notice over on the right, the, we're going to play this a couple times, there's a lot to watch. On the right, you've the far right column is the actual AFR for each cylinder. On the left is the corrections, the ego corrections that's, that's being applied to each cylinder. And we actually, on this run, did not really have our PID loops in great shape, so they, they move around a couple of tenths of a point. But it's pretty impressive to see what's going on during that pull. Let me also draw your attention to injector timing. Why don't you go ahead and run that again? We're going to repeat this a few times. Take a look at this injector timing field right here. This is based on uh, a lot of steady state and then sweep testing, what the engine wanted for injection phasing. You see it move around. Start, it uh, seems to hover around 360 degrees, which is the default. And it actually wanted to advance with time. And you can tell by listening to that thing that it's uh, running pretty healthy. Um, something else to look at, run it one more time. The second one down on the top left, ignition advance. They make these pulls from 3,000, they log from 3,000 to 7,000 RPM. And you'll notice that our AFRs were only really sorted out from 3,000 to 7. We literally spent no time anywhere outside of that range. This guy also clocked 1.51 foot-pounds of torque per cubic inch, which, as I understand it from a BMEP perspective, is, is way up there with, with competitive professional motorsports type stuff. Okay, next page when that one winds down. Go ahead and click on that link. This is uh, another land speed car that uh, Jerry and his guys and a lot of people, Jean Ballinger and I, I've called a lot of you expert guys for help on this car. Go ahead and pause it for a second while I talk about this. This is, uh, is in-car footage from Lee Cecilio's uh, 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona. Um, and stop me if you have questions. I'm, we're going to open it up to Q&A here in a second, but feel free if somebody has questions. Um, current record holder of the AA engine sized blown gas, I'm sorry, A engine sized, 498 cubic inches. It's a Ray Barton built Hemi based on the uh, Gen 2 426 Hemi. Um, and it currently holds the A blown gas altered coupe record. Basically, this class is the fastest production body guys out on the salt at Bonneville. This same guy has a twin sister to this car that's naturally aspirated that, that currently owns right now the uh, naturally aspirated production body car record at like 252 miles an hour, two uh, mile averages back to back. Um, but this one here, he built the turbo car uh, and, and wanted to go fast in the forced induction class for production body cars. And ideally, when this is all said and done, it's about 10 mile an hour right now short of being the world's fastest production body car. There's one in a different class that's slightly faster, but our aim is to go uh, maybe 310, 312 miles an hour on, in an average with this car right here. And it, uh, to give you an idea, there, there's some pretty serious involvement in this team. We've added uh, Neil Roberts. He works at uh, Honda Racing. He's uh, our aerodynamic engineer on this car. And even though it's production body, there are things that we do, like we knife edge the back of the fins or the, the tail piece, you know, and, and, and things that uh, he suggests that we do. Um, we do tuft testing, uh, oil droplet testing on this thing, um, and even used uh, um, a bunch of the Chrysler wind tunnel test data. There was a SAE paper published on the development of this car. Go ahead, James. We had scheduled wind tunnel testing at the A2 wind tunnel, which is down in this part of the country, and brought Neil Roberts on thinking, hey, we're going to go to the wind tunnel, you know, come with us, aerodynamics guy. And he told us not to go because the data he got from the guys at Chrysler, I guess that white paper, he said it would cost us millions of dollars to duplicate what they already had on this body. And they had all sorts of data at different ride heights, different changes to the body, things like that, things that were or weren't within the rules. But he said it was everything he needed to know to set the car up. And here in a minute, you'll see on the data how things worked. Um, anyway, uh, this car is a Mega Squirt 3. The, the kit built Mega Squirt 3 with a three-point Originally a 3.0 board, and that's a 3.57. Um, I use an IO extender 
So I've got eight EGTs, um, I've got front and rear wheel speed, Every fluid, there's, there's like eight different fluids in this car and every one of them has temperature and pressure. Very important, I think, if you're doing a cooling system to also have coolant pressure. It's cheap insurance, we're talking about that on these guys' car. Um, so if you're forced induction and you start lifting ahead. Um, anyway, let's just go ahead. This is a run right here. This was our best run to date. Uh, 288 mile an hour exit speed, 282 mile an hour average in the last mile. He did, I'm sorry? This is gasoline right here, basically C16. Go ahead and turn up the volume. So you notice you got the EGT from one of the cylinders up on the top left. Suspension travel right here is kind of important. The rear moves more than the front because the rear is a linear rate and the front is, uh, comes in at an angle, the sensor does, so you see it move less. But as this thing picks up speed, he's in first gear right now, gets pushed off by a truck, ignore the squeal, it goes away. You see what starts happening on the suspension side. First off, he's not more than 60% into the throttle and he's spinning the tires already at 120 miles an hour. Pulls it in the second gear. Cool attempts coming up. We're getting into boost a little bit. Look at the suspension on the gear change, what happened there. You see it actually upset the car front to rear. And also look what's happened on the suspension after that gear change. What's happening now that he's up to almost 200 miles an hour, you start seeing things dip down. That's the downforce being applied to the car. There's fourth gear, his top gear. He has five gears and he forgot to go into fifth on this pass. But really not making much boost, not into the throttle much, but you see the suspension now, it's, it's much lower than it was when he started off. He ends up hitting a rev limiter at 7,200 RPM. Every one of those sets of flags is a quarter mile going by. And every orange set is a mile. So he's in the five right now, five and a quarter, five and a half, five and three quarters, hits the rev limiter, gets out of it, clutches, off the throttle. Look at the suspension here. This right here tells our chassis guy that the parachute is not hooked up to the car properly. When he pulls the chute, the front takes a huge dive and the rear lifts up. And what that means, in our case, is that the parachute anchor point is too low in the car. It's below the center of mass. Yep, so it lifts the rear end up. Well, it actually went straight, but it lifted the car a little bit. Well, that's the kind of data I get for these guys. And, you know, half the time I don't know what to do with it, but it, you provide it for those guys, you know. Capture as much data as you can, is my point. And then down the road, six months later, you might be looking at it and say, oh, you know, crap, that's really helpful stuff. But anyway, that's uh, just a couple of examples. Um, go ahead and do the next slide. So there's a data log of that run, and it actually would be more fun if you guys want, I'm free to, I'm free to give out this data log for you, but I've got front and rear wheel speed. That's the guys in the middle. You can see the wheel spin at the top of first gear. You can see him pulling second gear. You got RPM map, everything up there. Um, if anybody wants to actually have a copy of this, have at it. The white line in the bottom is my actual AFR. The red line is <laughs> me being happy that we have ego correction because my tune sucked on the top, as you can tell there. But Jerry and Matt helped me sort this out real quick on site. But uh, that car has run pretty successfully, and really we are just waiting for good conditions. It's been two years of crappy conditions since then at Bonneville. That you need the right conditions to set a 300 mile an hour record in a production body car. So if anybody wants a copy of that, you know, let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to share that data log with you. It's pretty cool to have a you know, near 300 mile an hour data log. So, all right, that's all I have. So question time, fire away. If any, I mean, hopefully we got some. Bueller. James. That's from the SD card. I had a secondary computer in this car, a car PC, um, and it was running Linux, and it basically acted like the laptop, okay? But I had that for a primary data logger and this as a backup. On that particular pass, I had uh, a cable come loose and it killed the serial connection between the car PC and this was captured. I had my most important stuff on the SD card. So this is SD card capture right here. Yeah. Not for a long time. I've done some of the old zero to five volt. Was that the Ford sensor? That must have been six or seven years ago. Yeah, the frequency. I have not, I'm not on a Megasquirt one. I've done it on a Pro EFI and it worked. The only concern there was the fuel flow through those things. Some guys are plumbing them wrong. You know, 
Yeah, if you do the proper loop, they work good. And I know you guys have. But anyone else? I just got to have more questions. Yes. Skyrocket high, right? Everybody asked me, holy crap, how's, how can you do 1900 degree EGTs? What's going on there? I was freaking out at first, and then I talked to some guys. I talked to Kenny Duttweiler, big turbo guy. And he, yeah, and he comes and looks at our stuff, and he's like, dude, the reason that is is because you've got your probes sticking all the way in the center. Our probes, the tips are at the center of the exhaust cross-sectional area for the exhaust manifold. So a lot of guys you see in drag racing move them out just to the edge, and you'll lose three or 400 degrees that way. So I'm running basically... Pretty much the richest AFR I can run on that C16 type fuel, which ends up being scarily like low 12s. As you break into the 11s on some of that fuel, you'll actually get misfire. It doesn't want to burn. Um, and I've found that uh, not running too retarded of timing. Try to find the right timing for the car. Don't run too little or too much. The right timing, and you know, you'll, you'll get your best EGTs. That was the best I could get them down to. Engine guy takes apart the engine, looks at the piping inside, and he says, oh, this looks really healthy. It doesn't look anything like the drag engines that come here totally destroyed. So the feedback I got there was, it's okay. But everybody sees that number. And I mean, we, we actually tested them. We uh, calibrated them at like three points, and they were dead on. We used uh, uh, the sensorconnection.com. And I know Jerry now sells EGTs that are really good. We're running your EGTs in the new car. But at the time, we were using the guy from the sensor connection. He's, he's pretty helpful as well. He's another good vendor with lots of different short, long probes, different diameters, different rates that they respond. But uh, I'm not generally the biggest fan of EGT tuning, but it's good to tell if you've dropped a cylinder on an engine like this. These big cam domestic V engines, they uh, very easy to drop a hole and not know what's going on until they just don't perform. Yeah, yeah, I like uh, eight holes per cylinder. And I'm actually experimenting on the uh, alcohol drag cars here this next week. Um, we're doing sample tubes off the exhaust manifolds so that you don't, you don't cook the sensors immediately on, you know, on a 4,000 horsepower alcohol motor. Um, we're actually playing with sample tubes um, to get the EGT temps down of the sample gas. This is something that the emissions guys do. So uh, there, there's probably a market out there, Jerry, for something a little, uh, a manifold with sample tubes that go out and tap into your exhaust for boosted applications. Yeah, yeah, they're very, very handy to do air fuel per cylinder. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's where it used to be. Yeah. Right, right. Not, not, not yeah. It's said that there, I mean, some of these guys publish on the Bosch and NTK sensors the susceptibility to, to pressure changes, temperature changes. I have learned not really to care. You know what I mean? I, cause I, so what I use the wideband, I almost don't care if it's telling me Lambda or air fuel. Uh, or, or number of hot dogs that I'm going to eat for lunch tomorrow or whatever, just so long as I have a reference point. Like, you, you're gonna, on the dyno or the chassis dyno or the track, you're going to ideally run that engine at a couple of tenths richer, a couple of tenths leaner, and see how the thing responds, how it performs. You know, at that point, you're just using that as a reference. That's, that's kind of the cop out I've always used for the cheap sensors. That's why they have $6,000 ECM, um, you know, very serious wideband oxygen sensors for the emissions guys that care. But I, I haven't really found it to matter that much. Yes, and I'm not really studying exhaust gas composition. I'm just trying to get the mixture right. It's a conversation I started with Jason Siegel with the way they were running the, the O2 sensor or something like that in terms of the feedback and how it was measuring versus, say, you know, a zero to five volt or how we measure it. They were saying in, in Pro EFI, which is Mototron or whatever, that the OEM you know, had decided they were, it extended the life somehow of the O2 sensor some way, and it was a different kind of reading error. It allowed it to, it would use the same hardware, but it wasn't a zero to five volt. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I think it was something to do with their heater control method was right. part of that as well. Um, I, I, a lot of that stuff I was, would, I've seen, I actually saw that post. <laughs> And I wrote that a lot of that off as just snake oil. Some of those, some people in this industry, it's really hard to get, like, like they're, I, I don't know. I've had enough trouble with firmware upgrades on that stuff to, to not just trust too much of what comes out of some people there. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I tell you this, I have, I've used that same Woodward system that they're using for stationary engines. I do a lot of tuning and calibration for electronically controlled stationary engines in the uh, oil and gas and irrigation industries. And uh, I actually have the same Woodward algorithms that they're using, like on my laptop right here. We can poke around and look at it if you want to. But, but to see their controls for the, for the O2s, I know there's more advanced stuff there. 
I don't really know why. I don't have a problem killing sensors because I'm not running Woodward, so you know, move on to the low-hanging fruit is, is how we uh, say that. Yeah. We have. So the guy that, uh, Danny Miller, that had the early Hemi, um, he asked the same question. So he went so far as to rig up a single exhaust pipe where we put O2 sensors, eight O2 sensors in one exhaust as it was going down the line. And uh, the first thing we found was that it reads leaner farther down the pipe and it was probably a, an oxygen or, or something to do with the plumbing and the, and the system there. Um, but we started moving the sensors around and they all seemed to read the same based on the position they were in. So the, the best thing we could do there is free air cal and see what they read free air when, um, you know, when we're getting ready to start the project. So yes and no. You know, I have guys reading spark plugs that are telling me, okay, this looks right, and that's kind of a, a magic thing that I don't understand. But uh, no, I've not done what I would consider lab grade correlation of those sensors. I've had the same problem. Right. 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 You have to trust, uh, you have to use your gut in a case like that. Sure. No, but I mean, I know that if I'm, I, it's frequently where we're using a dyno for engine masters where they have O2 sensors in the collectors and they'll get weird stuff all over the place, you know, even though I'm getting, you know, once I get relatively decent balance, those generally line up fine. I prefer to use the sensors that are closest to the uh, exhaust valve. My choice, personally. Because if you look at uh, like Ray Barton racing engines, there's some, some relatively big Megasquirt users for their uh, stock eliminator, uh, like their Copo, uh, what are they, the, the Challenger, body and white Copo cars that they drag race. You, you call up Chrysler, you give them $150,000 and they give you, yeah, drag pack Challenger, that's what those are. Well, um, the Copo, yeah, I call it that. It's the corporate office production order. They're technically all Copo cars. But uh, you buy this $150,000 car, and if you opt for the Mopar powertrain, you get a Ray Barton tuned engine, which is really awesome, naturally aspirated, you know, 800 plus horsepower um, with stock, all kinds of stock components. Um, and it's got a Mega Squirt 3, a private label Mega Squirt 3 running that engine. And yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, they are dominant in stock eliminator, like scary dominant with that combo for the last four years now. But uh, same deal there. They did the uh, 802 sensors, and they actually run those engines. Once they have all eight of their cylinders locked out, they'll run them at like 14 and a half to one on gasoline because you can. One of the big reasons I think most of the OEMs run 12 and a half to one at wide open throttle. There's obviously the power enrichment and chamber temp issue if you're going to run wide open for 30 seconds or more. But I think the reason is because they have cylinders that'll be one and a half, two points off in air fuel ratio difference. Even stock, if you put a bone stock LS on an engine dyno with eight wide bands in it, um, you'll get a one and a half point variation between cylinders. And at 12 and a half to one, there's one cylinder sitting there running, you know, 14 to one. Um, so once you've gotten your individual cylinders lined out, you can push them back lean to where they'll make the most power and, and things work, they don't break. So my thoughts on that, go ahead. So, sometimes you will see a difference. Now, power-wise, depends on the chassis dyno and the drivetrain, but tune-wise, I think you're asking, like, how much do I have to change the tune after it goes off the engine dyno? So at Blueprint, I did these really killer tunes on their LS engines for, uh, uh, on the engine dyno, on their Superflow 902, really sweet, good throttle response, cold start, everything seemed perfect. We go drop it in the first customer's car and it runs like crap. The tip-in response is horrible, everything is screwed up. So one of my tasks was to figure out what is the difference and what's going on. And the three second answer, it was uh, the operating voltage of the power supplies that we were running on the dyno. So I got me a variable power supply and I started getting into injector offsets and dead time and that problem almost goes away. You can get an engine dialed in really close if you run it at the same voltage and loads that it's gonna see in the car. And if you actually map out your tunes for at least two different points, like take it down to like 10 volts, 10 and a half volts if your ignition system will support it. Um, you can figure out your ignition dwell at that point as well, as well as your offsets. But uh, I'm a big fan of correct and proper um, dead time and offset and small pulse widths calibration for the injectors you use. And coincidentally, um, if anybody's out there uh, using injector dynamics, I have all of the Megasquirt 3 uh, form 
Um, the offset information from Paul Yaw at Injector Dynamics. He actually got into Megasquirt 3 here this last year and started providing me with uh, calibrations that already had not just the, the dead time curves in there, but also the uh, small pulse widths offsets, which are really, really slick. Um, I was super happy with those. These Engine Masters Challenge, uh, they have horrible power supplies. We've been anywhere from 11 and a half volts to 16 volts during a pull, and your tune gets all over the place. Closed loop has to work too hard. You lose some points. Once I started doing the uh, the dead time and offset calibrations in there, uh, my, I'm running open loop on a lot of these things, and they run just fine once they're hand calibrated. I sort of can explain it, and it's funny. I'm not as nearly the engineer that half these guys are sitting out here, but uh, but basically, there's a table in the Mega Squirt that says for small injector pulse widths, let's say one and a half milliseconds or less. Is that a good example? Um, the actual fuel delivery versus the commanded. So a lot of these injectors have a non-linear. So if you go down, say 30% in duty cycle or pulse width number, um, you you may not go down linearly 30% in fuel delivery. So there's a, a table that lets you tell the mega squirt, what's my actual fuel delivery if I'm commanding a 0.9 or a 1.2 milliseconds? Oh, to get the delivery I expect, I actually have to do 1.25. Is that a decent example? Okay, and that stuff, um, it works really, really well when you're trying to tune good tip-in behaviors to have that stuff right, or you got a huge injector on an engine that doesn't want to, you know, idle at more than one millisecond. Go ahead. You? Oh, okay. Got it. Agreeing. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Back to the, the Y-bands, offset voltages and grounds. You know, there are there's so many people that use the AM Ugo gauge because it's cheap, it's easy, it's, yeah. you know, it's not complicated, there's no free air calibration. It just plug it in and it comes out of the box and it works. You know, and there's been many, many times on many cars with some harnesses that are not so great. Right. Yeah. Uh, or ground God, situations. I run into this a lot. Go ahead. You know, the, even if the, the sensor ground you know, for the, the Y band is in the exact same spot as the Mega I've even done in testing, taken, say, on a 3 3X combo, taken a, a ground wire off the bottom of the, the 357 board or whatever, and just use that and ground the, the Y band, even though it's not good practice, don't do this. Sure, sure. Uh, through the 357 ground plane and still have a half a volt off. Yeah. You know, it's, there is, it's consistent half a volt off. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you see, so you just got to just plan with it and just go that way. But then if someone looks at a log or something, it's like, no, 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 it was, it was running too lean. No, no, no. <sighs> My quick fix for the AEM issue there is that uh, I'll make an adjustment and I'll do a custom scale so it matches it at two points. You know, and, and I have the benefit of span gases where I work, so I can actually just sit there and give it a mixture and, and test the sensor. And I, I've done that a couple times. I think their problem is that they're running the heater power supply grounds through that same ground. I, on, as, as the Uigo has one common ground, doesn't it? So I, I've ran into that same problem on some of the uh, Innovate products, but they, the blue and white wires, they separate their grounds for the, and they tell you to ground them in the same place in the manual. I've had that same two tenths, three tenths of a volt off. Strange customers complaining because my gauge doesn't match what's in the you know Tuner Studio. Um, and simply separating the blue and the white guys, uh, one of them to reference ground and then the heater ground off somewhere on the chassis, um, almost always solves that issue on those products. Don't know how to fix it on the AEM, I always just rescale it, you know. James? What? Yes. So. Yeah, so last year, uh, Tony Bischoff, he's one of the top, uh, if you follow NMRA, NMCA uh, type drag racing, he's one of the top engine builders, nitrous guys, and he's also a four-time engine, uh, engine Masters Challenge winner. And uh, his tuner got sick last year, and they asked me to come help. They were playing with Megasquirt 3 on an LS engine. Um, later, Chevy LS engines have variable cam timing. It's not as cool as what you guys are used to. It actually moves the whole cam, and since the intake and exhaust lobes are on the same cam, it's really just like active degreeing of your cam. But it is a hydraulic, electric over hydraulic control 
and it requires a PID loop. So the computer says, hey, I need to move my cam four degrees advanced, add a little more oil pressure through PWM, and then watch the position you know, with the software, with the Megasquirt 3 firmware, uh, and then just kind of adjust that, much like targeted boost control or anything else with a PID loop. Um, anyway, he wanted to make this work, and one of the big dilemmas in LS world is if you use the OEM variable cam timing, you have to use it with near stock valve lift and spring pressures. As soon as you start putting a high lift cam and higher pressure springs to hold the valve train together, um, the variable cam timing system doesn't have the authority and the stock computer freaks out and you're done. So they were at that point where we can't run a girly stock cam, but we really want this variable cam timing because it was worth a lot of points. It helps them broaden their, their torque curve and their average power goes up over a range. Um, so they were, they were dead set on using Megasquirt 3. They went so far as to modify the actuator a bunch of like machine work and mill work, and somebody's got a lot of time in this, where the oil uh, acted on a greater surface area, so it gave more authority to the mechanical parts of the system, and then they needed a, a closed loop controls. Where we, everything was working fine, but where we got into trouble was when they had the cam core done. The, uh, the movement of the cam, the 21 degree range we had, uh, stepped it outside. It was, it was a 24X pattern, and so it, it had problems with the firmware detecting um, the cam sync because it, uh, I guess it moved the cam teeth too far one direction or the other. And James took care of us and wrote some quick custom code um, that accommodated that, and that project worked really well. And it ended up being, in an event that's won by tenths of a point, the way they scored, it was worth 30 points. And that was actually the top finishing pushrod engine um, at Engine Masters last year. It got fourth place. So, and, and that was all VCT, and, and they just called me, we're doing it again next weekend. So they're gonna run uh, Megascore on two different engines this year, very happy with it. So how it worked in their case, um, I don't have graphs here, but you would, you would plot two, two graphs on a wide open dyno pole. Let's say you're making an engine dyno pole from 3,000 to 7,000 RPM. In complete low position, um, one position of the cam, you would end up with <clears throat> 20 or 30 more foot pounds of torque at the hit, but at the top, your peak power might go down five or 10 horsepower. Then you switch the cam to the other position, and you'd end up with much softer at the beginning, the lower RPM pole, and you'd end up with more power at the top. What we did is we laid those two graphs over each other and said, hey, there's about a 500 RPM band where they're identical in the middle no matter what. That was where we did our repositioning of the cam through the pole. So, and I actually have, I think I have his data here as well on that, the actual reported position. I now have guys using the variable cam timing software. Jay Brown, another Drag Week competitor, he builds these very expensive Ford FE engines, SOHC, you know, the camera engines that are, the blocks are like $40,000 on these things. Um, he uses the, v, the variable valve timing code just to monitor, uh, he's got f two different cam sensor pickup sensors and you know on these dual over or this two single overhead cam version of this engine and he actually uses it to monitor the chain stretch how much the cams are moving so he knows how much to degree his cams <clears throat> we put the system on his engine for drag week about six months ago and he could not believe that these things james remembers this he could not believe these things are moving like I don't know, 12 or 14 degrees out of whack, something like that. And also, coincidentally, the engine was down like 80 horsepower on power. You know, but this Megasquirt stuff can't possibly be right. This has got to be wrong. So Jay goes out and buys, you know, he's got a $1,500 ECU, but he spends about $4,000 on really high-end Honeywell sensors and magnets to embed to, to minimize any electrical errors or whatever. And sure enough, the thing did exactly the same thing it did with the cheap cherry sensors that we were using. So he finally says, well, maybe we'll try it out. Redegrees his cam and picked up like 80 horsepower right off the bat. And this is a 565 cubic inch V8 uh, <clears throat> that makes just under 1,000 horsepower naturally aspirated. And he raced it at Drag Week this year. And halfway through the week, week it had rods hanging outside the block. It's a very expensive block. It happens. Someone over here. Yeah. Have you ever messed around with any of the Holly Dominator? I do. I have. I've done six or seven Holly Dominator installs. It's pretty funny. It's a, it's a hell of a Mega Squirt 3 clone missing some features is really what it is. It's a nice piece of hardware, but uh, it, it's interesting to see 
you know, they obviously looked at Megasquirt 3 a lot when they came out with that system because they're, they're just trailing us on a number of features. Um, they don't have individual closed loop per cylinder trim. They haven't figured that out yet. But they do have individual trims that are map based instead of fixed. Um, it's okay. You'll find yourself, it's, if you've done Megasquirt products, you'll very easily be able to run a Holly. You know, what, what I think is funny is all these guys on the internet forums, yeah, you know, I got a Holly. It's sitting in a box. It's awesome. You know, and then they go to install this thing and find out all the same things that you needed to know about sensors and actuators to do your less expensive mega squirt applies to those guys as well. So there's a whole bunch of people that bought them, think they're awesome, and now they're in trouble because they don't know how to make sure that their 60 tooth crank sensor signal is clean. Have you ever messed with any of the traction control stuff? You know, pulling timing, cutting spark, any of those things? I really was set up to do it this year at Bonneville and it got rained out. I had a mule car and everything that we were going to do the front and rear wheel speed and actual like active traction control. I've messed with the time based perfect run, perfect pass type stuff. No, no, I want to do the, I have not, I've only played with it a little bit, but not, not in uh, this kind of venue and I'm, and I'm set up to do that on another car that next time we get out there. No, getting ready for engine masters. Yes, it does. No problem. Anybody else? I'm going to be here all day, so if you come up with questions or you want to see, like, the, get a copy of the actual data logs and some of the stuff I have, just hit me up and I'll put on a memory stick for you. That being said, is it lunchtime? Just about lunchtime. Just about lunchtime.